And speaking at conferences is a good way for me to, uh, you know, to not teach, but to uh, you know, give people information on specific subjects. And one of the things that is also interesting in speaking at conferences is that I have a lot of uh, research interests, but um, it's not always easy to be able to present all of those research interests. And when you speak at conferences, there's a few avenues where you can present your interests. So for instance, I'm, aside from doing curating, I'm also a, a critical fashion writer. And when I do conferences, I talk about different issues on um, fashion and intersectionality, and there's not a lot of, of spaces where I can talk about that. So speaking at conferences is a good place for me to be able to, uh, to do that. So then, after all of these uh, Toronto adventures, I came back to Montreal, and I worked at RDQ, which is the artist run center I work at now, and I do the programming there. I've been there for about three years and a half. And one of the things that I'm really happy to be doing at RDQ is that I'm able to present uh, underrepresented artists, so artists of color, artists of marginalized communities, and artists who don't necessarily have the space to be in the, to uh, the spaces to be presented in art galleries, because a lot of the art world is you know, ruled by cis white men, and it's really difficult to go through that because they're not really interested in giving away any of their power. So working at uh, Articule and being in a position of power, power really allows me to give space to people who don't usually have it. But it was not easy for me to be able to do that work because I, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's not easy for people here to, uh, to see a woman of color uh, in a position of power. So that was one of the things that I had to deal with. I'm still dealing with this now and I think I will always have to deal with this, but I think that by doing the work that I do at Articule, um, it, it, it really allows for conversation and for things to happen and for things to slowly change. Um, yeah, so one of the, another thing that I also, um, like from living all of this and going through all of these things, there's a few things I noticed. I noticed that even, th even though I did um, a graduate diploma in curatorial studies, you don't necessarily learn how to curate an exhibition. It's not something that you have like a step-by-step -step guide to do. And so I really wanted to understand why people are putting their money into these programs but not necessarily getting something out of that. And so that's why I curated the uh, curatorial tips, which are um, a research and help tool that I created on Instagram where I just give advices and tips and like tricks and tools on how to curate exhibitions for, ex for emerging curators. So I have... Um, I have started this project because a lot of times there's a lot of, um, um, not contests, but you know, uh, programs where you can apply to curate an exhibition and you work so hard to prepare that show, but then some, like, and then you don't get to present it. And then there is no real way for you to be able to present anything if you're not actively curating or if you're not already in an institution. And so I do those, I, I give those tips in order for people to be able to keep thinking on their practice even though they're not actively doing something and so that they can nourish their curatorial practice until they actually get, uh, get to present something. So I have a lot of fun doing that and you know, you have to feed yourself with other things than what you do for a living because uh, you know, otherwise it will be boring. Uh, another thing that I can say that is really important is to uh, create your own network. So when I did my undergrad here and I, I noticed that I was not really going anywhere, I had a, I had a colleague that I had classes with who uh, created an exhibition where she took all of the artists in Concordia that were never accepted anywhere and she just created a show with them. <laughs> so I sent her an email and I was like, you know what, I feel your vibe, you know, I get what you're doing. <laughs> and to this day we're friends that we're actually collaborating on an exhibition together now. And so I think it's really important to be able to carry discussions with people that are like-minded so that you can actually create projects. Um, and also, if like for people who are in visual arts, it's really good to um, 
speak to people in art history and vice versa because the artists that you will have classes with will probably have careers later on and you will have a curatorial career so it's really important to you know stay connected and you know hang out with like-minded people and that's also a reason why I'm always coming when Concordia is inviting me because there's a lot of frustration I got from coming here and I'm really trying for you guys not to get those. <laughs> Uh, another thing that I can also mention is that is the importance of uh, friendship and collective work. So it's really important to work with your friends because even if you go to any exhibition or any space, people are actually working with people they know and that's also a reason why you always see the same people everywhere. So just become that person so that you and your friends could like support each other and give each other spaces. And I know I don't have a lot of time left, but one of the things also that I can mention, if you can find a mentor, that would be something good, because it's through the mentorship of uh, Gaetan and other, cura other like women black curators that I could actually get where, I'm, where I am now. And yeah, if you don't see yourself represented somewhere, just create that space and put yourself out there so that you can fill that gap and not just realize that it's missing. So I know there is going to be a question period, so I don't know if I was clear, but you will have the time at, at that moment to ask me a lot of questions. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Denise. That was amazing. Just so that you guys know, if you have the booklets, there is a place to write notes. So do write down your questions because there will be a time where you can ask them, as I'm sure you might have some. Um, so our next, our second speaker is Avery Zhao, um, who is the founder of Art Crush. Um, she's got a lot of projects going on, so I don't even know how to properly introduce them all, but I'm sure she'll tell you about it. So. Hi, everyone. And Thank you to Kuja and Yara for inviting me. Um, it was a really nice exercise actually to sort of go through past memories and see what I've done with my time. And um, yeah, it's always good to look back for, from the past few years. Um, so I guess I'll start off with a number. I'm 33 years old now. And I feel like this year I'm at a pretty comfortable time in my life, I am pretty at, at peace and happy generally with how I spend my time, and I find that's one of the the challenges is uh, the dis the decision of how to use your time. Um, so I'll share some stories of past like struggles, logistical, creative problems, um, and how I've worked through those. I've worked in two different fields: fashion design and fine arts. Um, both in Montreal. I did fashion design in Paris as well. Um, so fashion design. I was in that for f several years and I was good at my job. I actually am proud to say I had a pretty good salary and it was what I had studied for four years. I was on shopping trips, trend research, and it was great. Um, but I found that there was sort of the creative creativity lacking and it it's a pretty tough job as well. Um, there's also this little nagging feeling, which was like a pretty big personal reason why I decided to go into fine arts, which was that I realized that my main interests and like the kind of information or research I was doing, I'm uh, seeking out, was um, not rela really related to my job. So in fact, the topics my mind would wander to the most was not really useful to me at work, to my boss or coworkers. And so one thing I realized is that if you are constantly seeking out um, some kind of information on a subject that you don't work in, um, that could be a hint that you could should shift maybe your work so that it matches your main preoccupation. Um, so of course I'm not talking about like a side job to supplement income, but what you identify with as your main activity. Um, yeah, it's just what, what you can't help but think about, um, can't help but research and learn about, that could be a good career indication. Oh yeah, awesome. it's open. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> so um, now I'll skip to talking about Art Crush, which I founded in 2013, which is when I sort of decided to leave fashion design and go into the fine arts. Um, so yes, asking for money. Because I had stopped my full-time job, and this was before I was really implicated in the Concordia community and before I sort of knew uh, or was aware of how to get grants, um, my go-to at that time was Indiegogo. So a few years ago, Indiegogo was probably a pretty popular thing. Now it's not so much. <laughs> um, and so I had a couple of friends who really believed in my idea, which was Art Crush, an in multidisciplinary um, crush of three different art forms on stage, a performance. So it would be dance, visual arts, and music on stage at the same time. I was lucky to have a few friends not really, really in, in art who was believed in that, and so we decided to do an Indiegogo pitch. This was in 2013. Again, so, um, and we wanted somewhere pretty to film, and we just, uh, I chose a greenhouse. <laughs> and this was the wet, a greenhouse in Westmount that is now closed, unfortunately. Hopefully it'll reopen. Um, and it was free to use it, and so we're like, wow, this is a great area, it even has a seat, so. <laughs> and the thing we didn't count on was that it took four hours to film the whole thing because we kept screwing up or laughing, and, and I was wearing silk, and um, at the end, it was just really miserable. <laughs> the videographer was just like sweating it out, and um, it was quite, yeah, it's so interesting. Um, but I always remember that because I learned so much from that experience. One thing is that no matter um, how you start, the first concrete step you take to a project, if it's awkward or embarrassing, um, as long as you bring some people down with you, <laughs> um, as long as you bring some people along with you, um, actually you have begun. Because after that, you sort of feel like you have a moral duty to them to continue the project. Like that videographer who did this whole project for two hundred dollars, he just and he had a cold too. So um, you feel like you, not only for your vision, but to the people around you, you owe it to see it through. And that was a that was something that <clears throat> an interesting experience. Um, so after that, we actually did get some um, funding, and that was great. And we started the project. We booked a venue, we had the artists. And the reason why we asked for, we wanted to have funding is because in all my projects, I always pay everyone involved from the artists to the technicians, which I think is really important, um, even if it has to come out of your own pocket. And so then the next milestone in my life was the performance. Seat capacity 600, uh, 600 at the venue and attendees 50. <laughs> um, we had, we were really ambitious and we booked Pollock Hall and McGill, which is a great performance space and it's very big. Um, but then we were doing this very new art format with a small communication circle or, net, or network, so that was the result. <laughs> Here's the hall. <laughs> Here's a picture of us doing stuff. That's not, there was more people than that. That was just us setting up. Um, but what I also learned after that is that even if there's not a lot of people who show up, um, there could be, as long as there's one person who you reach or the right person, that's sometimes all that matters. Because there were, there was an artistic director there who um, then invited us to his summer festival in Saint Lambert. This happened after the following year. Um, <clears throat> this was a the performance called Heart and Breath, and we collaborated even with um, Richard B. Perry of Arcade Fire. He was involved in it, and we were paid uh, pretty well to perform at Festival Classica. Um, and from this experience, uh, here's some more shots of that. Um, just as a side note, is that I guess especially in the beginning, always choose people who um, believe in your project more than people who are famous or well-known. Because those are the people who have the patience to help the project succeed. And that's um, something that I learned that was very useful. Um, 
Right, so after this, um, if you are working in experimental art projects or performances, you'll usually find like right after the performance you feel very elated and it's very exciting. But then over the course of the following weeks, um, sometimes like fear might creep in because there's always mixed reviews of a show. Um, and then you just have to deal with those feelings because it's hard to start again another project knowing that there's these flaws or, or problems with your work um, or the fear of people saying, oh, not that again, or, you know, like, but it's okay if it takes you a while um, to plan your next project because you could, it's a good thing too to take some time and distance. Um, so the next part, the milestone was after these performances, it also caught the attention of a filming, like it was a music production company, and they invited us to film uh, some art crush videos in the Maritimes. So here's some shots of that, and it was great. They, you know, pay for the travel and expenses, um, and so you just see how it can just snowball from there, from this one like really little idea, if you just keep at it over the years, it will, you know, it will go somewhere, usually. <laughs> As a side note, I'll just talk about some other um, networks you could or reach out to. For example, for FASA, I was a coordinator from 2015 to 2017, and you really learn a lot when you're in that kind of um, group. So whether it be Kuja or Yera or any other kind of student association or group, as long as you're part of it, you learn so much. Um, just how to organize, how to get information, to follow up, and also that you know you're responsible for seeing something through. And apart from student groups, you could also check out if there's anything um, that some kind of that you something about you that maybe there's like a, an association out there in the city. For example, in my case it was YCPA, which is the Young Chinese Professionals Association. I, hadn't, I didn't know they, re they existed, but actually they're a pretty good, big group in Montreal and they do all kinds of events. Um, and it was nice to sort of get out of the art bubble and sometimes dress up and go to like some kind of function. Um, and that those kind of groups can give you a lot of support for what you do as well. The last one is RAV. Um, I'm currently a board member from 2017 to 2019, and RAV is the Quebec affiliate of CARFAC. CARFAC, and they set, they work on huge lobbying um, projects with all the museums of Canada and uh, with galleries, so they push for artists um, rights and also like everything in your interest. For example, if you're doing a conference, what is the minimum fee you should receive from an institution? If you're showing your work and your work is being um, is being printed in their catalog, for example, the museum's catalog, you actually you receive uh, some fees from that. Um, so that's a something really that I uh, hold close to my heart. Just. Um, pushing for artist rights and uh, their fair payment. Um, so yes, back to Art Crush. After, after some, so we've kept doing performances and most recently a big deal was that we performed at the Salle Bourgie at the Musée des Beaux-Arts. Um, and so that's me painting, I built some structures for it. Uh, and sorry, I didn't make, just realized I didn't make this full screen. <laughs> anyway, um, I actually don't know how, but that's okay. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. So yeah, I just uh, wanted to take you on this little journey of how it progressed from this little idea to an awkward pitch to um, badly attended event and. You know, it can snowball from there. Um, and what I also wanted to touch on is um, 
Yeah, it's really great to remember the people who helped you in the beginning and who believed in you and nobody else did. Um, and on the other side of that, always be on the lookout for people who um, might need that little push or if you can collaborate with them, they're not, you know, uh, that, that's also a pretty good thing. And um, yeah, I think the ending is just to stick with uh, what, we, what you want to do. Um, yeah, that's it. So our last speaker before we take our first break, we'll have a Q&A and you guys can come down and eat more yummy food, um, is Brittany Potter, who is the co-founder of Centerfold, um, which is an organization whose goal is to promote art and creativity by funding artists. for the introduction. Um, I'm super excited to be here. Um, I will give a disclosure that I lost my voice two days ago, so um, just bear with me. If I have like a coffee fit at some point, I'm okay. <laughs> um, I obviously started a, an organization called Centerfold, um, which sort of derived out of a successful event series. Um, we, I have some slides to present, but I think I'll get into them a little bit later and kind of discuss how we began, I guess. Um, to give you a bit about my background, I moved here um, from Vancouver straight after high school, um, and I just graduated. It took me five and a half years, but I did it. <laughs> um, and I got my BFA in uh, Studio Arts, and uh, I basically found myself where I think a lot of people can relate uh, in like my second year. I was not really, I, I, I found out I wasn't as passionate about art making as I thought I was. Um, I was friends with all these amazing artists and I loved everything about the art world, but um, I wasn't, like I, I figured out I wasn't going to be a painter basically. Um, I think painting is still a, like a great personal endeavor of mine, but um, found out it wasn't really quite what I saw myself doing every day for the rest of my life. Um, so I kind of found myself in like this weird gray zone of the creative industry where I was enjoying these certain topics like curation and you know the idea of like creative direction and all these things, but didn't really know how to place myself. Um, and I think, you know, we all kind of find ourselves at like the family function uh, where every aunt and uncle is asking you, what are you gonna do with an X degree? Um, which, I mean, even if you do know the answer, I feel like nobody likes that question. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I was really troubled with the fact that I, I, I thought I had everything figured out. And then suddenly, second year comes, and I'm like, what am I going to do with this degree? Um, so basically, I uh, started sort of applying around town for different internship positions. Um, basically, anyone that would hire me, um, I was applying for it. And the first one I got was at a little concept art school called Sin Studio, which is sort of like specializes in like gaming art and uh, sort of like the fundamentals of drawing and stuff like that. And so I sort of, I had the interview, it went well, and they said, okay, you're hired, what can you do? Um, and my classic millennial answer, I was like, well, I can run an Instagram account, uh, <laughs> like, I can run a Facebook. Um, so I did that, I ended up doing that for two years. Um, and it was like a lot of trial and error and like was really, nice to be able to figure it out as I went along um, and from there I managed to convince a cafe owner um, to let me run his social media for like exchange of coffee and food which as a student I mean you all know that's like a big deal <laughs> or it was at the time it's still important. anyways um, and then so the third one that I got um, in like my third fourth year was at an artistic marketing agency called Landmark, 
Um, and that was the first time I was really immersed in like uh, an office setting um, where they were connecting brands and artists and um, you know taught me how to develop pitch decks and taught me how to network and all these important things. Um, and the reason why I go over all of these different positions is because I really feel like they really helped me develop um, the skills that I still use today. And since it was, you know, free internships, you are able to try things without having too much repercussions from it. Um, and so those were really still, I kind of consider like the meat and potatoes of um, what I sort of started to develop into Centerfold. Um, and from there, I was sort of able to figure out, I mean, I had been looking for that answer of the question, um, what are you gonna do with an arts degree? But through these positions, I was able to find out uh, more of a concept that I was really in love with and something that I was super passionate about, um, which was accessibility. Um, I was you know, having these discussions with my fellow co-founders of Centerfold um, parts of the art industry that we didn't necessarily agree with. So, you know, why is it different when you go to a show or a, a concert, I guess? You know, pe you pay for a ticket. Um, we're going to Verdi Sages and we see everyone there, but artists aren't paid to show a body of work, which I found very troubling. Um, you know, people were more like enticed with the idea of like free wine and like mm -hmm. taking a cool Instagram picture. Uh, than they were about, uh, you know, really interacting with the art on the walls and like when you have artist friends and you're practicing art yourself, you really start to understand the life that goes into a body of work. Um, so having these discussions, understanding that there was kind of like a gap in the market, we decided to create this event series called Interfold um, because it was something that I thought was really important for the art community and um, you know, originally it was just one, um, it was supposed to be one event and it ended up being, now we've had about 15 events, um, and it was all sort of based off of this, uh, voting method, which I will get into a little bit after, but, um, back to my discussion on accessibility, something that I always found really, really troubling was, um, you know, for young artists getting their works in front of buyers and for buyers being able to see um, and have access to seeing art shows and art spaces. Um, I think like one of the most troubling things is seeing someone going and spending, you know, 200, 300 dollars at HomeSense when, you know, there's a young artist that lives next door where that 200 bucks could be like really helpful. That's supplies, that's food, that's everything, right? Um, so I was like troubled with those barriers to entry on both sides um, and Thus, like Centerfold was was born, I guess. Um, these are some of our past uh, um, like event photos. Basically, we sort of developed a uh, voting method with our events. So people would come in and they would pay um, a cover charge, as you would um, a bar or uh, a concert. You know, five, ten dollars, and you would receive a voting card. And then based on that, you would write down your three favorite pieces in the show. It's all different Montreal artists. And then based on the percentage of votes that every artist received, it was 100% give back of the donations we got. So at the end of the night, um, sometimes artists were able to take home $180. Um, even if they received just 1% of the votes, they were still getting 1% of the donations. Um, so really trying to help artists get paid to show their work because I mean, we all hear these paid with exposure um, lines that, you know, kind of come through um, as opportunities for artists, but, um, you know, we really wanted to bring together the elements of, like, cultural, um, fun, social environments um, into an art show. So you bring a bar, you bring a DJ, and then you ultimately have a conversation piece. So you have people coming uh, and giving over their five dollars, writing their three favorite pieces, have a drink, hang out, and ultimately the artists feel really celebrated, um, which I felt was like a little bit disappointing um, was when I was going to Bernie Sages. Um, it seemed like you know, no one was really looking at the work all that much. Um, and uh, yeah, so these are some of the results that we have from past events. 
And um, yeah, 15 events later, we've been able to raise over $12,000 for artists over the past three years. Uh, we would be using different DIY spaces, so anything from a storefront on Saint Laurent to a loft space. Um, do it as a, a party setting as well, so people are having fun, people are celebrating, and uh, that's about it. Um, we basically now, actually tonight, we have the opening of um, a now new permanent gallery space, which I was going to plug that in at some point, <laughs> everyone should come. Um, we uh, also launched our online platform, um, so it's an online marketplace um, that also has a 3D gallery element. Um, where you can sort of move through um, a show in a virtual environment um, and uh, sort of bring the experience a whole lot closer to people. And these are a few photos of the gallery. Um, and yeah, it'd be great if you can come tonight. It's going to be fun. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're back. We'll be ready for three more amazing speakers. Um, so if anyone came during the break and weren't here before, this is the story event hosted by the Concordia Undergraduate Journal of History, Kuja, Yara, and her campus, Concordia. Um, and we're very glad to have you all. So um, moving on to our fourth speaker, um, proud to invite up to speak uh, Melanie Binet, the artistic director of Théâtre Nulle Part, uh, which is an artist collective whose objective is to question the relationship between audience and space, be it architectural, urban, public, or political. Um, I want to start my presentation by sharing how at first I was hesitant to confirm my participation to this event because I wasn't sure if I could or would consider myself as a success. Um, the reason why I'm sharing this initial reaction is because I believe this is a very female way to react. Um, like many women, I am subject to the imposter syndrome. And when I described this feeling to some of my female friends, um, it immediately felt very, very familiar to them, and their reactions were all the same. Most men would have just felt entitled to the, to, to the attention. Um, so instead, all I could think of was how I encountered obstacles throughout my career and how my trajectory as a professional artist still feels very precarious. Um, nevertheless, I managed to um, quickly brush away this negative self-judgment and reply, reply pos positively to the email invite. Um, but I think that the current social climate is changing the way I perceive myself as a woman as someone who deserves recognition, uh, validating my own struggles and achievements through uh, the stories of other women. But also perhaps the language of success is highly or uh, somewhat problematic. It inevitably involves competition, performance results, and productivity, all of which are core capitalist values, and all of which puts us women artists or cultural workers of different backgrounds um, against each other in a context where we have to claim our share in each given field. I don't know if I am an example of success, but I firmly believe that I am an example of resilience and commitment to my practice. Hence, the stories I would like to share with you today are stories of perseverance and dedication, and I hope you might find something ins inspiring in them. Um, I co-founded uh, Théâtre Nulle Part with a group of friends when I was 25 years old uh, in 2009, already a while ago, um, after having graduated for, uh, from a theatre degree at Université du Québec à Montréal. Most of the other co-founders were young women I had studied with. Um, we were dedicated to writing as a collective and to creating site-specific performances. Uh, in French, we use the term institut. Back then in Francophone Quebec, other theatre groups doing collective writing were rather rare, and they were mostly led by men. We founded this performance company out of necessity. As young female theatre graduates, working as a collective felt like an empowering way to uh, explore our potential as creators and to draw from each other's strengths. 
But working in situ also proved to be strategic. Uh, we invested in new territory. We appropriated performance spaces that didn't yet belong to anyone else. Back in 2010 in Montreal, it hadn't become a pervasive term in situ and a ubiquitous practice as it is at the moment. Um, and a lot of people still found it very strange, especially journalists, that we would uh, perform in such sites as public uh, restrooms, which was the site for our first performance, but of Yoshimik. I spent 2009 scouting public, public toilets all around downtown Montreal, um, getting kicked out by the security at CAM as we were rehearsing and testing our performance. It was quite a great way to test how public those spaces are, and interesting to note how a bunch of women hanging, hanging out for too long in public toilets would draw some attention. Our, our performance was about the female desire and fantasies, and it explored uh, through the experience of public and private spaces, um, it ex it, we explored the, the, the um, I would say the contradiction between the experience of uh, public and private spaces and public restrooms. And our characters read the uh, Harlequin novels hidden in the stalls. Um, there was obviously something cheeky about exploring female fantasies in public toilets, and luckily that didn't stop the director of Marché Bon Secours, a middle-aged man, to sign our partnership contract with him. Um, nor, that it, nor was he stopped by the fact that we were young women with no professional artistic experience whatsoever. Sometimes um, you have to carry on until your email it hits just the right person. Um, and this was incredibly refreshing because we had encountered a lot more resistance from the performing arts milieu, for instance from a Maison de la Culture director. Um, coming from a theater background, our first instinct was to contact those venues. Um, however, we soon realized that um, people with a visual art background were uh, generally more enthusiastic about our work. And I find it even now so incredibly important to search for the right community, uh, to find the right professional circle, uh, because therefore you, you will avoid wasting a lot of energy trying to justify the aesthetic value of your work because the other person doesn't have the same reference, uh, the same aesthetic reference than yours. We also got programmed uh, by uh, Art Souterrain and got very excited about touring the performance in the Palais des Congrès because uh, their women's restroom was amazing. <laughs> Um, but unfortunately, two weeks before the event, uh, the Palais de Congrès board demanded that we perform only for female audiences. Um, they are opposed to men entering women's restrooms, even just for attending a, a, a performance. Um, and I was appalled by how those board members imposed their bigotry about gender spaces. Um, and upon consultation with our members of Théâtre Nipa, we refused to perform there. However, to honor our commitment to perform during La, during La Nuit Blanche, I called an extremist, uh, the director of Marché Bon Secours, and he welcomed us back there. So he was a great ally. Um, our, oops, uh, it. Um, our second performance, uh, Fenêtre Murée Daylight Robbery, uh, was a bilingual production in a cul-de-sac in Griffin Town, right before the arrival en masse of condo developments. Um, Concordia professor Dr. Shauna Jensen uh, curated it as part of Urban Occupation Urbaine, her curatorial project uh, for her PhD degree. This was quite an interesting site, a narrow triangle caught between a functioning, a functioning sea and viaduct and a new city gas building before it became a club. Um, and we wrote a performance inspired by the neighborhood's post-industrial history and performed it using uh, our silhouettes to cast shadows on the sea and wall. We rehearsed in the rain, in the cold. Um, sometimes we had to dodge pigeon droppings. Um, other times we would hear people spray painting on the opposite side of the train tracks. Um, we, we were also on a really tight schedule. We only had one month to produce our work. But all of these constraints uh, shaped the atmosphere of the performance, translated the urgency 
of telling the story of that space, of that neighborhood that was about to get transformed forever. Um, Shona is also the person who um, introduced me to Concordia's individualized program at the School of Graduate Studies. Um, and the perspective of pursuing an interdisciplinary graduate degree was exactly what I was seeking for as an institute artist. I already was burning with a research question, how do we talk about uh, the experience of site-specific performances? And it still is a primordial question for the documentation of such ephemeral practices. I fiddled with this question in an article I, I published in 2011, but I wanted to dedicate more time to research this question. And go, going back to school began to feel um, essential for my development as an artist, even though it might not have been um, a very opportunist move in terms of developing an audience for our company in marketing terms. Okay, so meanwhile, okay, I'll, I'll go a bit quicker then, sorry. Um, so meanwhile, I also created another performance uh, with Théâtre Nulle Part that took place in an empty commercial lot on saint Laurent Boulevard. And this was a, uh, an incredibly fun piece to perform in because it involved uh, mixed medium, audio tracks, video projection, cardboard pu puppetry. But um, we also experienced more problems. Uh, again, with performing in situ back then in Montreal, the Union des Artistes did not understand the form of theatre we were trying to produce, and they bizarrely actively worked against us, threatening not to provide a permit some time because our performance wouldn't fit their, their ticking boxes. Um, so, I'm going to skip a little bit because I feel like I'm running out of time. Um, I was speaking much quicker when I was rehearsing it at home. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I did a degree at Concordia. I did a performance um, in the EV building just around the corner. Um, but I had to stop it, uh, to stop the creation of that performance because of the student strike in 2012. And this became a really important moment for me. And for me, it's important to stop sometimes what you're doing in your creation in, a, in order to uh, become an activist. And um, even though it's not always like the, the most sensible thing to do for your career, uh, but then your, your political implication will feed, your, uh, will nurture your career. So that was part of it. And then I, when I finished, when I graduated from Concordia, I engaged more with a community-based practice like many Concordian alumni. <laughs> um, and I did a collaboration with Chez Cristo Pub, a community restaurant in Chicago Maisonneuve. I spent a year uh, getting involved with the community there and we worked on this sound installation that um, was available for people eating alone and for people who, are, um, who experience difficulty to communicate in person. And last summer I did another, so that's still uh, Chez Cristo Pub, and last summer I did another uh, uh, installation um, in, um, in uh, near Parc Extension in the, in the on the future campus of Université de Montréal. And this project, um, for this project I decided to involve a community nearby, um, which is um, uh, from, a, from a community group called Africo Féminin. And, um, and I was really eager to involve a, this community group because I wanted to include people who weren't from the Milan or the Milex, weren't from the so-called creative class, to uh, invest this new space and um, to share their skills because those, uh, this group of women were uh, doing embroidery. And I wanted them to participate in uh, the production of a new public space not just um, reserved for artists and students, but to bring in the community around. And, um, and I'm just going to conclude now with um, just to say that a lot has been written recently about women's emotional labor uh, and the way I witnessed it in the art world, in the academic world, and in charities as well, is how women are often less concerned about their ego and more oriented towards contributing to their community of peers, uh, towards producing socially engaged work, um, raising concerns about labor exploitation and prejudices, uh, conducting actions that are not necessarily des designed to directly benefit their careers, 
and the women I had a chance to work with are committed. Uh, they don't count their hours, and sometimes they get exhausted. That's why I want to be careful with the language of productivity, success, performance, competition, because oftentimes it doesn't fit the way that women organize their labor. Thanks a lot. That was wonderful. Okay, so um, we should have put on to our next speaker, Joanna Brzezowska. She is the Associate Dean of Research at the Faculty of Fine Arts um, at Concordia University. She is also a member of the Textiles and Materiality Research Cluster at the Media Institute, um, the 11th floor, if you guys know, and the founder of the Excess Labs, which is a design research studio focusing on textile based um, wearables. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I only wish I had been here for the first half of the presentations. You know, this is this topic of women and careers and success. How do we define success? The topic of fear are so important to me and more so than ever because I recently had a daughter and I don't know I'm going to cry. <laughs> so you brought me to tears with your beautifully written presentation. That was really amazing. So I'm here. I'm embedded in this institution right now. I came on about 15 years ago as a tenure-track faculty member in design and computation arts. And I've moved up the ranks of administration since then by becoming department chair and now uh, as associate dean research. Um, so when I was thinking about what to talk about in these 15 minutes, I first thought I would just deploy a whole range of really depressing statistics about women in academia. <laughs> uh, I assume a lot of you have heard them before, and if you haven't, maybe it's not the right time. Instead, I actually decided to just go through a whole bunch of snapshots from my life. So I'm 45 years old, okay, so I've been around a bit longer than most of you. And um, I'm just gonna go through a series of photos that I actually pulled down from Facebook <laughs> last night to kind of tell the story and perhaps focus on some of these moments that were seminal moments, formative moments, um, as well as this topic of fear and choices, fear and compromise, uh, and how often actually the path to success is through compromise. I don't know if that's a gendered thing. I don't know if it is gendered to uh, not be on this monolithic kind of ego-driven path, since you brought up the word ego, versus actually being a bit more uh, subtle and pliable and sometimes bend but not break. Sometimes you might break but then you tape yourself back together. But it's definitely been a long series of compromises, okay? So the first compromise being is that I was actually a pretty good artist. <laughs> I, uh, I, I went to high school in Newfoundland and I even won the provincial high school award for the arts, okay? So I was Newfoundland, arts something, something, I did this painting, which was beautiful, and I won the first prize. But um, for a variety of reasons, um, um, which I think a lot of you might also be exposed to talking with your families, your friends. The arts are not considered a solid career. Still now, I mean, this was a while ago, <laughs> but things haven't changed that much. Um, so I went through uh, a few different sorts of compromises right away. So first of all, I actually enrolled in a math degree at McGill because I happen to also be quite good in math. After one year, I dropped out and I applied to Concordia, to Fine Arts. Um, my second compromise, so I kind of like, I made the compromise and then I stepped back. My second compromise was instead of going into studio or painting and drawing, which is what I wanted, my parents convinced me to go into design art. It was called design art at the time because there's more of an illusion of a career path after design than after <laughs> painting and drawing, right? Uh, and so I 
did, even though I was like still painting on the side in secret <laughs> in basements. Uh, no, I'm joking. But I was definitely like the kind of like rebellious designer, you know. I, I was always um, not necessarily following the brief. Uh, I ended up going to, and this was in the 90s, okay, in the early 90s, uh, and I ended up actually being introduced to new technology, so the web was just starting out, and like multimedia and computers, like Photoshop, the very first version of Photoshop. So I ended up actually moving in that direction and ended up getting a master's degree at MIT in a place called the Media Lab, which is very much about technology. So I kind of had this love of art and technology at this time, and you know, everybody was saying, how are you gonna do, how are you going to merge them? You know, maybe you can go into architecture because there's tech and art, which is yet another compromise. Thankfully, I actually found an interesting path. So this is me wearing my tech slash science hat, <laughs> which was electronic textiles. And I won't really talk too much about my research work, but basically I've ended up doing a lot of uh, fairly influential work in embedding electronics and textiles, so creating textiles that change shape, change color, that move on the body, using uh, all kinds of like chemistry and physics and electronics to produce these interactive garments, as well as actually working with scientists to innovate the next generation of fibers. So actually doing like material research, so fibers that can transmit light and change the color of light, etc. So at the beginning, I was still doing a lot of my own creative work, right? The second compromise came as I became more and more successful in research. And uh, it's a double-edged sword because with success, you get research grants, which is fantastic, but then you have to manage them. And you get to hire students to work on your grants, which is amazing. You get to publish, etc. But that means you get less and less time for your creative work. Okay, so this was a huge compromise that happened in small pieces because getting a research grant is so rewarding, and perhaps it's that element of ego that maybe is gendered or maybe just a personal thing. <laughs> um, and, you know, I didn't want to stop. I just kept writing grant proposals, even though it meant I ended up not doing any of my own work anymore. Uh, I also tried, like, a business venture. I always really loved teaching and working uh, with students and transmitting knowledge. Um, this is actually, I'll just tell this story. Um, this is hilarious. I did a workshop at this military academy, the Norwich Military Academy. And the reason I did it is uh, because they offered me a lot of money. <laughs> uh, but actually, this was, so it's a military academy where if students are in the military, they go for free, and otherwise you pay. It's actually a pretty good school, but they actually had like an arts faculty in this military academy. So he was actually like, a cadet, I guess. I don't really know the technical term, but he was like on the military track. But basically, this was like the best bunch of students I ever had. They were like, "Yes, ma'am." I was like, "Okay, go get, the, go get the threads." Yes, ma'am. They would go and like just lay out everything, and they actually did some amazing electronic textile work. Um, you know, so uh, I already started talking about the compromise of giving up my own work, but I skipped ahead of my story a little bit because I had a few slides here that really talks about all of the cool aspects of uh, that time in my career. So I actually started a little business venture where we were going to develop smart textiles for the fashion industry. I really love teaching, even though it's also another compromise I've had to make subsequently in terms of devoting less and less time to my teaching. Research has been really amazing. As an academic, you get to participate in conference juries, research trips, you know, to study different practices all over the world. Um, I was invited to give keynote addresses, you know, I got all kinds of recognition. This was, I think, last year or two years ago, where I was chosen to be a visionnaire Montréalais, which was part of this McCord project, of uh, photography project. Um, but really, it was a lot of 20-hour days as you're editing your publications, <laughs> as you're 
finalizing your project and it is a lot of fun but it's also really really exhausting so one thing I definitely did want to talk about is um, the compromise around motherhood right and since this is a topic focused on women um, it's something that I imagine a lot of you are probably thinking about I actually never wanted to have kids and I don't really know why. I think part of it was because I was judging myself already for even wanting to or imagining that I would want to have kids. Whereas in fact, this kind of success that doesn't often incorporate elements of motherhood, this definition of success, which is linear, etc., uh, it, it makes it very difficult. And I find in my generation, a lot of my colleagues who are in academia delayed having children. In fact, most of my girlfriends who are my age, who are professors, we're all having kids now in our 40s, which is really fucking hard. <laughs> <laughs> like sleepless nights at 43 and 44 and 45 are so hard. <laughs> okay, it's really hard. <laughs> Um, I'll skip through these. I've also worked with industry on different industry projects, you know, working with um, all kinds of uh, interesting people all over the world. Uh, I became department chair, as I mentioned, and oh yeah, kids. So I actually got lucky because about 10 years ago I met a man whom I fell in love with who actually already had two boys, and uh, I sort of was able to adopt a full family, so the boys moved in with me and they've been, they're still living with me. <laughs> now I'm sort of thinking, okay, when are they going to move out? But apparently they don't do that these days. Um, so I inherited these two boys who changed my life for the better without having to go through the early years of sleepless nights and diaper changes, which if I didn't mention already are really, really hard. Um, so these are my two bums, and then this is the newest little bum who was born two years ago. So a lot of my colleagues, you know, are having kids in their 40s, and a lot of them can't anymore. A lot of them, uh, a very good friend of mine had twins, and unfortunately, genetically, we have, uh, because our DNA is older, we have higher chances of mutations in our DNA, so there are higher chances of um, various health issues, I suppose. Um, and it's something that I'm happy to take questions on, actually, because I feel that was perhaps one of the hardest compromises I've had to make in my life. So I feel there's been a price to pay for every success, okay? And I really, um, so this was the other price, I actually have not painted in 20 years, but I actually really love my job right now, the new associate dean job that I took on. One of the reasons I took it on though is because it allows me to integrate the realities of my new motherhood, okay? Uh, I'm extremely fortunate that I'm able to kind of have nine to five days, except not this week. <laughs> um, that I'm able to, you know, leave if the kid is sick and I need to take her to the hospital. And when I was younger and working the 20 hour days, it would have killed my career. Um, so I'm now in administration, which I really love. I love working with younger academics, helping them shape their research paths, help advising them on their grants and research funding. But would I have been here had I not had children? I don't know. Would I have been here had I uh, not listened to my parents and pursued my painting career? I'm not sure. There's so many choices we all have to make, and the only kind of thing that I feel really strongly about is to not be afraid to screw up and not be afraid to make bad decisions along the way, to not be afraid to make mistakes. Mistakes are just as important, bad choices are just as important as good choices in the grand scheme of things. 
Um, and uh, I think I'll just end on that, and maybe if there's questions later, I'm happy to revisit any of these themes. So thank you again for inviting me, and thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, I just want to double check. Has it been ready? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Our last speaker is here. Um, thank you all for sticking to the end. There will be a 15, 20 minute Q and A um, for all three of the speakers that have just that will have just presented. So keep them in mind and write them down. Um, so we'd like to invite Arandi Vergara to come speak now. She is the artistic director of Eastern Bloc and was programming coordinator of Studio XX from. September 2015 to 2017. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. I forgot my presentation. <laughs> this is just for the name dropping. <laughs> so thanks to Concordia Journal, uh, undergraduate journal of our history and ER magazine for inviting me to be here today. I always I love to come back to Concordia. I have a crush on Concordia. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's good to be here uh, to talk about these uh, women I admire uh, and uh, to just share a little bit of uh, my story, I guess. And so I'll start quickly uh, to tell you a little bit of how I got here. And it was good to get these questions uh, to shape my presentation because these are not the things we often talk um, when we are invited to talks or something like that. And so I thought it was a good context to start thinking, indeed, how did I get here? And so, um, well, I get here. So uh, I study communications at Mexico City. I'm from Mexico City. And the last year of my uh, undergrad student uh, uh, studies in Mexico City, you have to do a thesis for your undergrad. So I uh, focus on the history of media art in Mexico City. At the time, there were not many uh, resources to either find books or information and also to see uh, the pioneering pieces. And so it was a lot of digging, a lot of going in through uh, personal archives of uh, artists and creators. And, um, but it was amazing because I was so passionate about this topic and it was so hard to find information and I just kept going. And uh, so I wrote my thesis tracing the history of media arts in Mexico. And then I also, because I was in communications, I have to do uh, to produce some kind of visual, audiovisual or multimedia. That was a word at the time, multimedia work. And so I produce a website, and I'm very bad at documenting my own work. It's no longer online, but at that time, it kind of mapped out the history of media art in Mexico City from the 70s to the early 2000s. I finished my undergrad in 2002. And so I created this website and I started a residency at the Central de Imagen. It's a photography museum uh, in Mexico City. So I created this website with them. Uh, they offered me uh, access to equipment and actually taught me how to produce this website. And then I was invited to, to present it there. And the day we presented it, when we were, uh, when the conversation was over and we all, uh, we finished and we got out of the old chairs, the director approached me and said, what are you doing after this? And I said, I don't know. And he said, would you like to work here? And I said, yes, because the first time I went to this museum, I was like, I want to work here. <laughs> So, uh, so that's how I got into the art world. Uh, I moved from the uh, school uh, to this uh, fantastic museum where I learned a lot of things. I had the opportunity to work with and meet a lot of artists and creators from all around the world. To see how an institution like that uh, runs, there's two big biennials uh, at this uh, uh, space and it was also great to just be in there and learning how they run. And um, so I worked there for three years. And, uh, but I wanted to, I really love school while I was doing my undergrad studies. So then I, I always wanted to do a master's in art history because then I knew I wanted to go into the art world. And uh, 
I, during, when I was doing my, my undergrad research, I found a lot of uh, uh, historical information about media arts coming from Montreal and Canada. And you know, the art scene had been very strong in the 70s. Uh, there were many artists run centers and spaces that were created to uh, enable artists to have access to technologies. So that, that's a story I learned as I was doing, writing my own thesis. And so I knew I wanted to uh, come to Canada to do a master's because in Mexico, as I mentioned, there were not a lot of resources uh, for research, but also I wanted to have um, a theoretical basis to continue my, my career. And so I applied to Concordia. I didn't apply to any other university. I just knew I wanted to come here. And I got in and I loved it. I was here for two years. I worked at the FOFA Gallery. Uh, and I had the opportunity to uh, be surrounded by amazing faculty members that were always supportive. And, uh, and I met some peers and it was a really good experience. Uh, I love access to the library. And so these are things that shaped my career actually in a very important way because I had access to what I was uh, um, expecting and is the historical, uh, theoretical background to support my career and, and, and my own intellectual uh, curiosity. And so that was a long time ago. And uh, so yeah, that, I, I moved in, in Canada in 2005 and I just love uh, Concordia. But I'm always curious, so I decided right away to go into a PhD. And I like change, so I was like, I cannot stay with one philosophy. So I went into McGill to study art history as well. And I wanted to work with Christine Gross because I knew she was working around issues of contemporary art and media arts. And again, like I just needed more of that uh, intellectual stimulation and historical and uh, theoretical perspective on the histories of media art. I got more and more interested in two post-colonial theories, uh, feminist theories that was before, but uh, Concordia did shape my career in that, say, in that sense. I had amazing faculty uh, seminars on post-colonial theories, uh, Aboriginal art, you know, before it was hot and before <laughs> it was featured in museums. I had the opportunity to see many of the artists that are now featured and recognize, and so that was great because it really made me understand how important it was to consider the history of media art from critical perspective and trying to understand why uh, it was necessary to, inc to include discussions around um, who has access to technology, who assembles technology, where are these people based, where are the uh, virtual worlds that we are imagining with these technologies, and all those questions that I became more and more curious. So I went on to McGill. Uh, my dissertation at the end focused on uh, interactive installations from Latin America. So I kind of go back, went back to these, uh, to study uh, contemporary art pieces that have touched me personally and that I hadn't seen featured or uh, written about. So. Uh, I also enjoy it, but while I was in McGill, I created, throughout the years, uh, I created a lot of shows as independent creators. I collaborate a lot with some of my peers. I always invited them to participate and do uh, organize ex exhibitions or other kinds of projects. So this is a project I pitched to Studio XX while I was at McGill. It's called Fake It. So it was a series of uh, artworks by Mexican women artists work dealing with uh, um, gender issues and questioning ideas of femininity and so that's another show I created uh, that used to drive my supervisor crazy she said stop creating just finish your, th your thesis <laughs> but I want to say that that's a bit you know like we're talking here about career and professional life and university life and for me this is part of my uh, university life. These creating shows, working with artists have always been part of who I am and uh, it has shaped my scholarship and uh, yeah, so 
I created a lot of shows as an independent creator. And then in 2015, while I was finishing my PhD, I applied to Studio XX. Uh, there was a job opening uh, as programming coordinator. And I applied to work there because I thought I had something to say and to do at that organization. Uh, I have participated, as I mentioned, I created one event at Studio XX and I have uh, attended many events over there and I always thought, oh, they, they could do that, uh, they should do that. That could be a good idea in this space. So when I applied for the job, I had a clear idea of what I wanted, how I imagined this organization to grow and what my role would be on that. So I worked there for two years. And I will talk to you about two projects because we're talking about gen, uh, women in, in professional life and, and empowerment. And so we'll talk about two projects I, I created that I produced at Studio XX. One is called Feedback List, uh, your portfolio review. Uh, many artists, you know, because I was surrounded by women artists, uh, there were always questions about like, that many women didn't feel comfortable to approach creators, uh, that they didn't feel uh, strong enough to uh, put, their, put their work out. And uh, as you can see in e events like Electra, Print and Numerique, and many events in Montreal, uh, the featured artists are, are often a majority of men. It doesn't mean there aren't women, but it just means there are more men. And so this is one event uh, we created with the idea to have a space where artists could talk about their uh, questions about their own career and have a context where we have three creators, an international creator we invited at the time from Germany, Tina Slander, uh, Cheryl Sim uh, working as creator at DHC, and myself. And so we have the artists present briefly we have them in advance send those questions of what they wanted feedback on, and we all provided feedback, not only the creators, but also the uh, artists themselves, the other participants. And it was a very fruitful experience because some of the questions they had, actually all of them had, were answered with the first or second artist. Because then we realized there was a, there was a lot of, uh, they, they were asking the same questions, you know, how do I put myself up? Uh, out there? How do I send uh, my portfolio to uh, a creator? How do I improve my website? How do I write a better artist statement? So those are the things that shape this event. So it was a very small group. But I like small groups for the reason you get a chance to be um, in a more personalized environment. And the other one is uh, Listen Up, Public Speaking Workshop for Self-Identified Women Artists. Again, with this idea to empower women. Uh, this workshop actually, Claudine Hubert from Ovoro and myself came up with this idea. We were invited, there was a big event at New York uh, uh, featuring Quebec uh, artists. And uh, there, was, there were exhibitions in different galleries, there was uh, uh, artist talks. And the day of the artist talks, uh, they were one after another, artists from the US, artists from Montreal and Quebec. And uh, we realized after the, the artist talks, we went for coffee and we, real, we were talking about how we realized many women were less... How do I put it? Assertive, less secure, less, you know, they were just like, they were just speaking in a different way. They didn't look as uh, strong and they did not portray themselves as um, confident. confident, that's the word, as confident as the male uh, artists. And, you know, we were thinking, well, maybe it has to do with the language, you know, many Quebec artists that presented their work where uh, their first language was in English. But we realized that there was a difference among the uh, women from the US and from New York presenting the work and women from Montreal uh, and Quebec. And so we come up with this idea, like we should, we should organize a workshop. And uh, Claudine mentioned, do you remember that film that it's called uh, Je pars fort, puis je suis pas ridicule. 
What's the name of that workshop? It's, that it's film. It's in the far side of the moon. It's it, Robert Lepage. The Robert Lepage yeah. film. And so that's why, listen up, in, in English, in French, the title of the workshop was uh, Je pars fort. <laughs> and that was the idea uh, to create some, to come up with a set of tools to uh, how artists could present their work. So in terms of content, what do you do? What do you talk about in an artist talk? But also, how do you present your work? And for me, those two events are important because these workshops do not take for granted that because you're a good artist, you can have a successful career, whatever that means, or you can uh, feel strong enough uh, and confident enough to, to talk about your work. And so that was Listen Up. And I also, last project I work at Studio Exec, it's an exhibition I co-created with uh, Tina Landenberg and it's uh, featuring uh, virtual reality works and uh, the idea is to uh, again question how in hell is it possible that the many VR works in the gaming industry, in the art industry as well, are basically doing the same thing that people were doing in the 90s, but you know, it's been been a long time and so we did some research. What I mean is like many of these works still thinking about this uh, amazing futuristic spaces, uh, often uh, beautiful modern design or niche of uh, nature oriented or abstract works uh, with slim and beautiful people and so knowing that there is a tradition of feminist and post-colonial artists and scholars questioning the wonders of the uh, electronic wonderland. Um, I knew that if I started digging, there were artists working around, like questioning, or working, producing other kinds of virtual reality work. So we started doing some research, Tina, uh, with the Goethe Institute support, Tina was able to come to Montreal, this is with Olivia, I think she works here at Concordia. Um, she's working on VR. This is Tina. And so this is Paloma. And so this is in Toronto. Toronto. This is the powers. So this is uh, another work that I, another show I work on. And um, the last, okay, so that's. That's about kind of the work, some of the work I did at Studio XX, then I finished my PhD and also felt I needed a change. So I applied for this job at uh, Eastern Bloc as uh, artistic director. I started in October, like a few months ago. And um, I also have continued to work in different uh, independent projects as creator. Uh, I will facilitate a workshop at the world next week on creating. And um, I continue to work out along those lines. Uh, I continue having ties with Mexico in different ways, sending artists from Canada, trying to connect artists from, from Mexico into the artwork here. And I guess what I can talk, what I can say right now is what success mean to me in that context. And I think something may, I might have not mentioned is how passionate I am about what I do. And I enjoy these projects a lot. I always come up with new ideas and I just get super excited and I start working on them. And, and so for me, success, and I consider in that sense myself a successful woman in the sense that I have been lucky enough to do projects that I'm passionate about and that I, I think that passion uh, is projected to the outside and uh, I, I agree with Joanna, there's a lot of things that you have to give up um, but honestly to me it's been so fun and I feel lucky uh, because we all, not everybody has the opportunity to do what they like. Sometimes many people don't even know what they like, and so I feel very lucky to know what I like. 
And success for me means that, that for the, since I discovered I like media art and art, I've been able to be in that world. It's not easy. Um, success in that sense, it doesn't pair up with a, a salary or, or a healthy uh, working hours. <laughs> um, but to me, it also has been super fruitful and fulfilling in that sense. And so I think I'll leave it there. I'd like to take more questions and just talk to you and hear uh, the other panelists' perspectives. So thank you so much. <laughs>